Let's talk about a shift that is happening with the black population here in the US. The makeup of black people in America is looking different. After centuries where most black Americans could trace their American roots back hundreds of years, immigrants are making up a fast growing share of the black population in the US. The Pew Research Center estimates that the black immigrant population in the US has surged in recent decades, from about 800,000 in 1980 to 4.6 million now. By 2060, it's expected to grow to 9.5 million. That same study found that one in 10 black Americans were born outside the United States. Black immigrant households are more likely to be college educated, have higher median incomes, and a lower rate of poverty. But the Pew study also found they're just as likely to deal with discrimination and racism. As an example, black immigrants are just as likely as US born black Americans to own a home, with both rates well below the national average. And while black immigrants have lower poverty rates than those born in the US, their poverty rate is still above the national average. But black immigrants have often been overlooked in the immigrant experience because until recently, it was hard for them to immigrate here. Let's talk a bit about the history of black immigration to the US. It started with the slave trade, as hundreds of thousands of Africans were taken to the US involuntarily between 1619 and 1808, when the US outlawed importing people as slaves. After that, we saw more than 150 years where it was really difficult to get back into the US if you were black or any other person of color, especially from anywhere outside North America, due to quotas that favored immigration from overwhelmingly white European countries. We did see over 100,000 black immigrants, mostly from the Caribbean, make it to the US in the early 20th century through Ellis Island and other US ports. But an update to immigration laws in the 1920s heavily limited immigrants from anywhere outside Western Europe until 1965. That year, Congress passed the Immigration and Nationality Act, which did away with the quota system and opened the door for an influx of migrants from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Changes to the laws in the following decades also made it easier for refugees to enter the US, which helped increase immigration from countries that had civil wars, like the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. And with more opportunities to enter the US, we're seeing African countries make up a larger share of black immigrants. While Pew's study found that the Caribbean countries of Jamaica and Haiti sent the most black immigrants to the US in both 2000 and 2019, they make up a lower share in 2019 than they did at the start of the new millennium. Meanwhile, the share of immigrants coming from Africa has grown with Nigeria and Ethiopia leading the way for African immigration to the US. Now, New York City has been a hub for black immigrants, both for the longstanding Caribbean communities in the US and newer communities of immigrants from African countries. Newsy correspondent Ben Shimiso talked to several black immigrants about their experience and shows us how they're dealing with their own set of issues here in the US. On a Sunday morning in the Bronx, Praise the Lord. African immigrants get to hear from a special guest at the end of the religious service. My name is Audu. Uh, I'm an organizer with African Communities Together. As an immigrant himself, Audu Kadiri has sway with his audience. Most of us Africans, we think we can talk our way out of trouble. Not with American police. Like them, he left everything behind to start a brand new life here, thousands of miles away. Now he is a full-time community organizer, helping his peers navigate the new ways of their adoptive country. You have the right if they knock at your door to tell them, I don't want to open my door. It's hard work that is increasingly in demand. The black immigrant population in the US is growing fast, and not just here in the Bronx, but nationwide. In fact, it's growing so fast that one out of 10 black people living in America right now are immigrants. According to a recent Pew Research Center study, most of them come from the Caribbean and Africa, with the African black immigrant population growing the fastest. Actually begging for mm. my hand. <laughs> for Kadiri and his family, looking at photos of their past life in Nigeria brings mixed feelings. So I see how my family is there, I have my colleagues there, I have people I grew up with there. In Nigeria, Kadiri was a prominent activist, documenting hate crimes against gay men and organizing HIV prevention programs. A risky job that got even worse in 2014 after Nigeria criminalized LGBTQ rights advocates. I was attacked 
like why are you coming to you know to um, advocate for gay men don't you know these are uh, outlawed people I'm gonna be the big one. shortly after Kadiri escaped to the US but had to leave his family behind after being apart for six years they reunited in 2019 how to accept the reality at that time and know that and hope you know that uh, a day like this will come and eventually it came. Always the defender of vulnerable communities, Kediri is now on a mission to change negative perceptions of his own. What is it like to both be an immigrant and to be a black person in the US? It's a double trouble, you know, and even you face some kind of discrimination within the black community because of your accent. When you speak to a British, they have accent. The French, they have accent. We all have accent. So for me, you don't tell me I have accent and make it seem as if um, it is just me that I have an accent. This is my identity. Not far from Kadiri's house, also in the Bronx, is a small and unassuming storefront. Welcome to the Gambian Youth you. Organization Center. Where Ajifanta Marella and other volunteers have been collecting donations for the survivors of a January fire in the neighborhood that killed 17 mostly Gambian immigrants, including a member of the organization. The work we're doing here, it's something that we'll continue doing in, in remembrance of her, in remembrance of all of them. The high rise that caught fire is down the street. It started after a space heater malfunctioned. The building was the subject of many tenants complaints, including lack of heat. Next to it now stands a makeshift memorial. This is my first time here. Just being here just reminds you again, like it's people, it's human lives that were lost, that are no longer here, that can no longer speak up for themselves. This whole came about with like people bringing in stuff. Marella's organization raised $1 million in four days for the survivors. She says she and other members have been working around the clock since the fire, partly because no one else is coming to help. If this fire would have happened some in a different part of New York City, the response to it would have been different. Right. Black immigrants, numbered now at about 4.6 million, often feel excluded from the national consciousness. But Marella says they are here to stay. Pure research shows they are projected to grow to nearly 10 million by 2060. Ben Chamiso, Newsy, The Bronx. And Newsy national correspondent Ben Shamiso joins us now to talk a bit more about his reporting. Uh, Benny, first and foremost, thank you so much for joining us here on ITL. Uh, let's talk a bit more about the growing black immigrant population here and population trends. Uh, why are we seeing so many people come here from the Caribbean and Africa? And, you know, what are their hopes for coming to America? Hi, Christian. To understand the growth, the rapid growth of the black immigrant population, you really have to look at how U.S. immigration policies dramatically changed over the past 50 years. Three important dates there. First and foremost, in 1965, the United States got rid of quotas that mostly excluded immigrants that were not from Western Europe. Then in 1980, Congress created the refugee program as we know it today, allowing Africans from war-torn countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Sudan, or Somalia to resettle here. And finally, 10 years later in 1990, the U.S. created the Green Card Lottery Program, and that's only available to countries that don't send many immigrants to the U.S. already, most of them or many of them being in Africa. Now, finally, when these black immigrants get to resettle here and ultimately obtain their green cards, they are then able to sponsor their family members to join them here in the U.S., increasing the overall immigration numbers from those countries. Benny, going back to some of the immigrants you spoke to in the Bronx, uh, what does their experience look like adjusting to living here in the U.S.? Well, obviously, each immigrant has a unique experience, right? But you do find some pretty incredible stories among those who came as refugees, like Ajifanta, whom you met at the end of my piece. 
about 15 years ago, she was living in Gambia, and armed men showed up at her place and arrested her father. Her father at the time was the director of the country's national intelligence agency, and the country's dictator alleged that he was involved in a coup. So Ajifanta never saw her father again, and thanks to her mom, her family managed to escape and obtain asylum in the U.S. So when Ajifanta came to the U.S., she was only 12 when she moved to the Bronx, and she says that she owes absolutely everything to her mom. We know black people and immigrants tend to be marginalized. Um, how hard is it for folks like Ajifanta, who you talk to, uh, navigate being both black and an immigrant? Well, Aji Fenta and Audu Kadiri, the two folks you met in my piece, told me that they do face discrimination both because of their national origin and because of their skin color. Aji Fenta told me something that really stayed with me. She says that she's tired of having elected officials and journalists like myself wait until there is a tragedy like the Bronx fire to start showing up and to start caring about her and her community. Yeah, that's really strong reporting from Newsy National correspondent Ben Shamiso. Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Anytime.